Would you like to know the real difference between AI architecture and AI engineering? If so, this video is for you. My name is Mike Gibbs. I'm an enterprise architect with about 25 years experience. I'm joined here by David Lithicum, who's an AI architect and a cloud architect with about 35 years experience. And he and I have basically trained architects that work all over the world at the world's largest organizations. And there's a huge confusion among some people on the difference between an architect and an engineer. And I always tell people these jobs are completely different. They have different focuses. They have a different set of skills. So, but they always hear this from me, David. David, could you describe the difference between an AI architect and an AI engineer? And then after that, we can talk about what they do and the differences. Sure. Let's go with engineer first. <clears throat> Engineers are the doers. They're the people who carry out the implementation of the technology. And normally they have specific skills around different technologies in the fields. In other words, they may have uh, skills around, you know, using the AI technology that's in AWS, Microsoft, maybe Google, you know, maybe some of the open, open, a, open AI stuff, things like that. And so they they have specific skills around the utilization of a particular technology stack, and they, they call them full stack engineers. That's that's the what the view out there is they're basically able to take complete systems and data and all those sorts of things and create things out of them. They're very important, and you got to have engineers to actually build stuff, just like you have engineers yes. who build boats and submarines and cars and things like that. People have to figure out how, how everything fits together and everything is going to work together. The problem with that is they're typically not going to be the planners because they're saturated in building a particular system. They're also exactly. not going to be making a lot of the executive decisions around which technology to use and the patterns of technology to use. So in other words, that's defined by the architect. The architect carries out a different role. They don't touch stuff typically. And so they're doing the planning. They're doing the requirements gathering. They're understanding the business. They're breaking the business down to its functional primitive and building it up into some sort of a technological stack that they can define on behalf of the engineers. In other words, they go to the engineers with the plan to solve the issue, how they're going to solve the issue, the patterns that resolve, the types of technology patterns are going to leverage, things like that. And they don't build anything as if they did, they wouldn't be architects. And the engineers are able to take this plan, implement it, build it into something that's workable, you know, and work with the architect in terms of implementing the technology. So they're the builders, they're the doers, uh, the architects are the planners, they're the deciders, uh, they're the uh, business understand, uh, understanding people. They, they have business analysis, business acumen, leadership capability, the ability to communicate with stakeholders. Mm -hmm. They do completely different roles. They're complementary, but they they have their own silos and they have their own paths. Yeah. So you describe the planning piece. So here's the way I typically go into planning. You may do it very similarly. I start with the executives, and I want everybody to know what goes into planning and architecture. I try to find the strategy and goals for their business. I try to find what they're trying to do. From that point, after the executives, I try to find the key stakeholders and get their goals, needs, challenges, pain point, key processes. Sometime around that point, we try to figure out what is the best way to do certain things in that business. And beyond, at that point, I typically create a team of engineers and architects, but mostly engineers to go baseline the current technology. And then I created another team to help me actually create this architecture. And it takes about six to 12 months with a team of 15 to 50 people for the majority of the architectures I work on. Because it's so many conversations, it's so many meetings with vendors, it's so many meetings with stakeholders, it's so many presentations, it's just a lot of meetings. I mean, so when I talk about that, now I'm not an engineer, but you know, the engineers are coding these things. They're playing with the models, they're training the models, they're cleaning up the data and other things that you would know be able to talk about more than I would from the AI perspective, because you know you have much greater mastery of AI my, where my world is more infrastructure. But you know the, the point is, is we're doing that and we're not building, so it's there. So could you talk about the different set of skills that we would need to say be an AI architect versus the skills of an AI engineer? Yeah, I mean, you can kind of look at each of each of the uh, you know the, the the swim lanes there. So, in other words, communications. Uh, architects are going to have to have exceptional communications. They have to be able to communicate in writing. They have to be able to have spoken communications. They have to be able to understand how to coordinate 
coordinate with different individuals, including uh, people who are working in the line at the factory versus uh, also people who are, uh, you know, the C-level folks, the CIOs, the CFOs, things like that. So they have to be able to do lots of context switching as they're communicating with different individuals and be able to talk at different levels. Uh, and talk about different things are going to be important to those people. In other words, empathetic conversations at the end of the day. Engineers typically don't have to do with that. So in other, they're dealing with the architect. They may be dealing with the testing engineers, the DevOps engineers, things like that. The people who are actually helping them run stuff through the life cycle to make it happen. But normally they're not having a lot of executive conversations. In other words, they're not going into the client and, and talking to them because in many cases that would be confusing. Um, but they are talking to the staff of the architecture team, figuring out what's going to be done, how, what changes need to be made, things like that. So there's a lot of internal communications. So the style of communications, the frequency of communications is going to be very different between the two. The architects are going to have very infrequent communications with, uh, the, with the business, where the architects are going to have a vast number of communications with the business. In fact, that's primarily what they do. You just yeah. kind of mention the nail on the head if I say, what is a week look like in the matter of an architect there's going to be meetings and nothing but meetings lots of zoom calls lots of you know uh lots of document walkthroughs lots of you know uh lots of assessments in terms of requirements things like that so as far as how we're playing with the technology the engineers actually touch the technology yes. so they can tell me what the difference is between the different ai tools that are being used uh used in the marketplace right now which ones are going to be applicable for what we're looking to do and what's the best path to make that happen? And But they're going to be the ones who carry it out. They're gonna get the staff, they're gonna drive the development, they're gonna drive the testing. Everything that's needed to get from, okay, here's the plan how to build it to actually how it's deployed and put into production. The architect understands conceptually what the technology is. In other words, we need to understand the difference between training inference uh, and, and you know, model tuning and all those sorts of things, but only at a conceptual level. It doesn't yes. really pay us to get, pay for us to get down into the weeds in any particular technology because that, that stuff is always changing. Yep. It's always going to be shifting around. But the ability to have a discussion with the architecture team in terms of how we're defining inference, how we're defining training, how we're defining model tuning, how we're defining model performance development, how we're defining bias, you know, bias identification yeah. and manipulation, how we're defining ethic ethical components of the various systems, various high level stuff without going into particular technology sets. What I, way I like to describe it, in in is that there's a logical architecture, basically conceptually how it fits into the business, without any kind of physical technology that's defined in the logical architecture. Uh, you can call it a conceptual architecture as well. And then the physical architecture where you actually define which technology is in that space. Yeah. The engineers are about the physical architecture. Absolutely. The uh, architects are about the logical or conceptual architecture, how they're going to build it conceptually and how it matches up to the business. Yeah. The engineers are not going to have a lot of deep expertise in the business. They may understand yeah. the type of business they're working for, but they may not understand depreciation tables, nor should they. They may not understand you know, treatment patterns, you know, risk analytics, uh, you know, the ability to look at, uh, you know, how something bears back on earnings per share and all those sorts of things. It doesn't matter to them and you don't want to, yeah. it to matter to them. Their focus is on building the absolute best system that we can. Architects have to have a holistic understanding of a little of everything. Yeah. Uh, they have to have an understanding of the business, how the technology works and plays well together, and how the configuration of the stuff happens. And by the way, they're the person you go to when you're trying to figure out if something, it, it, uh, to ask somebody a question in terms of where the life cycle of the system is, what they're thinking is, how to make changes to the system, how to make upgrades to the system, how to deal with the requirements, you know, requirements versioning, all the kind of stuff you have to deal with basically in dealing with the business. So it's two completely different swim lanes. And so yeah. the week, and I say the week, you know, we always like to talk about the week of, a, of an engineer, which is the week of an architect, the week of an engineer is probably going to be three meetings. They may scrum for 10 minutes a day, uh, and but they spend most of their time at their workstations mm -hmm. in configuring the technology, testing the technology, figuring out which technology is going to be best, looking at the different vendors out there, having, you know, uh, form formulating opinions as to which ones we should be leveraging as part of the stack. Very detailed technical jobs. The architect's going to probably be in 20 or 30 meetings a week. Um, yep. You're probably going to end up talking to 200 plus people, including people that work for them and people yep. who they work for. Uh, and their whole life is going to be a one Zoom call after another. 
Uh, and that's what they do. They have to basically get on these short, these short meetings, communicate, figure out what's going on and be kind of the central, central, uh, clearinghouse of where the information needs to go to. So in other words, we're all communicating to the architect. The architect is in turn communicating with the business and communicating with the engineers and communicating with everybody on the architecture team and communicating with everybody who's on the engineering team as well. And normally they're the ones who are leading those teams. They're leading the engineering yeah. team. Uh, and they may be leading and as definitely leading the architecture team. I've done both. Um, and in many instances, you just hire a lead engineer and that becomes part of the architecture team that carrying oh, yeah. stuff out. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be a completely separate siloed organization, uh, depending on how they structure. So you have to be able to step in to different positions uh, and different roles and different personas. And but the big thing is you have to understand that you're going to do a lot of things and it's in, during the week and it's going to be very decoupled and there can be very different things where the engineer is going to do a lot of the same thing. Sorry if I ever explained that, Mike. No, I love that you did. In fact, when I left healthcare for my, I was an engineer for about three or four months and said, I just don't want to do this. And I moved into an architecture role, which I loved. And I went from being just bored doing the same thing every day to ha never having two days that were the same. And thankfully, well, in those days, we didn't have Zoom uh, and it was part of Cisco's telepresence. So I got to meet a lot of people and I loved that. I got to go all over and meet so many people, which ultimately built my Rolodex, which is now on a cell phone, but that's neither here nor there of people. And if I ever wanted a job, there were options. So I loved what I did. I love meeting people. All of it was great. And, you know, after training people that were engineers to be architects and training other people that are not architects, it takes about the same amount of time because engineering and architecture is just so different. And I think you, you, you keyed on something that I really want to talk about. So many people are worried if they didn't have engineering experience, how they're going to have to do an architecture. Well, knowing how to code something will not teach you how to speak with an executive and figure out what their business challenge is. It's just because it's such a different job. But the key is you're going to build this team. And on my architecture team, if I'm going to have network architects, I'm going to have a network engineer or two because that network engineer is going to be a lot more technical than the network architect. And we might need that. And I'm going to bring in some security architects and I am architects, but I'm going to bring in some security engineers. So a lot of people don't understand why they can't design it and build it. And I don't think they understand the number of conversations we have to truly understand what the business needs are to actually map the business, so the technology solution back to the business. So that's why, but you want to, I guess we can end with that. Why you can't design it and then build it and actually make this happen for reality, for real clients in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it takes different skills and different uh, and different team members or different skills to, you know, to make this stuff work. And I think, you know, viva la difference, you know, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I think early in my career, I tried to do everything. I tried to be an analyst, which means I build, I deploy, I design, things like that. And there were people out there who were attempting to do it. You can be excellent at uh, both silos. You can be good at architecture and good at understanding the business, but you can't be and but you can't be at the same time good at all the aspects of yeah. engineering. You're going to spread too thin. You're going to do both jobs poorly, and I think that's a matter of it. And so, and also the the, the type of people you have on your team and how the team yeah. structured is going to differ based on the yeah. requirements of the business and the requirements of the project that you're working on. But definitely there is two distinct silos out there. There are people who focus on engineering, people who focus on architecture, people who focus on the design and configuration of the technology and align to the value of the business, people who focus on building stuff. And I think yeah. that's okay. Now there's many flavors and different types of people who do that under those under those silos, but I think that's gonna be okay. But it's good to understand the differences between the two skill sets. Yes. Thank you for helping with that because I really want to help people because as it turns out, 60% of the people go on interviews to be an architect and they actually w train to be an engineer and they, they fail the interview just for that and because they and because they didn't know. And I want everybody to know, if you want to be an AI architect, it's the greatest career ever, just like an enterprise architect or a security architect. At least that's my biased opinion. I love these architecture roles. You've been an architect for decades. What's your impression of these roles? My, my impression, it's a fun role. I mean, I always had an interest in what the business was doing, uh, but I had a computer science degree. And so therefore I was destined to write compilers and configure processors, you know, processor sequences, things like that. Uh, however, I got bored with that stuff pretty quick. I wanted to get into the business. I wanted to understand where it is. I felt that that if I was off in a corner building something, I think it was perfectly fine. I see why people like it. The days just flow by. But however, I wanted to be involved with the front end stuff. In other words, figuring out how what we're building, how we're building it, what we're doing, all those sorts of things. I realized it was going to be giving up 
you know, touching the technology. However, I think that was okay because I ended up being in a much better position to help the businesses and a much better career for me, you know, based on based on my interests, my skill sets and where I wanted to go. Yeah, I found exactly the same thing. I have deep love and respect for the engineers that build these things. It's a tough job. Things are breaking and they have to be super smart to do it. But I also want people that want architecture careers like me to now know what they need to do to do this. David, uh, thank you so much for your help with this discussion. I always love when you come around and share your expertise with our audience. I wanted to let everybody know that we have an architecture webinar at least twice per week, and David's on some of them as well, where we go over what is an architect, like a cloud architect or a security architect or an AI architect or an enterprise architect. We talk about the skills that you need for these roles. We talk about what you need to build your brand and stand out to get hired after you have the skills for the job, not before. And then we will teach you the skills of what's necessary to go through, get people to come to you so you're not applying for jobs and getting rejected by an ATS. People are coming to you because they want you for various reasons because they know what you can do for them. And we run this free webinar every week, uh, twice per week. Uh, you can sign up for the free webinar in the link in the description of this video. We will talk about what we describe, but we will also answer any questions you have uh, live free on Zoom. So sign up uh, and I hope to see you there. While you're in the description of this video, we've got many documents to help you in your career. Some documents like how to become an AI architect written by David Lithicum, documents for me on how to become a cloud architect, for example, or how to win the interview. They're all free, so uh, sign up. They'll be emailed to you, and uh, let me know how they help you in your career. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and maybe uh, subscribe to David Lithicum's channel as well. I'm sure he has a lot of good videos, and I know there are terrific because I watch them too to help you in your architecture career. We look forward to seeing you in another video. Take care.